Hi everyone, uh, Jean Carapena, thanks so much for joining us uh, today. The, the purpose of this webinar is to, in, to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, Christine Sankvist is a head of unit of HTA and reimbursement at the Norwegian Medicines Agency, NOMA. Um, Christine is a pharmacist by primary qualification, has an MSc farm, and has a, a faculty appointment at the University of Tromsø um, in northern uh, Norway. Uh, the mission of the Norwegian Medicines Agency is to evolve and safeguard public and animal health by ensuring the efficacy, quality, and the safety of uh, uh, medications. Uh, the agency is also a decision-making body for the reimbursement for outpatients, in Norway and the provider of HTA evaluations of pharmaceuticals to be used in hospitals. Um, the Norwegian Medicines Agency is also a participant, an active participant at the EU-NET uh, HTA collaboration. Uh, Christine Sankvist has been with the agency since uh, 2014. Christine, thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate your time. Thank you and thank you for the invitation and opportunity to participate in this. I'm very, you, I'm very you, glad. You, you're welcome. We, we're quite excited to learn more about the, the application of pharmacoeconomics in Norway. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, what this all is actually all about is the access to expensive pharmaceuticals. That is actually the real challenge from, from our point of view. And um, this is actually a new phenomenon. Um, if you think it is historically, uh, that has happened the last 20 to 25 years ago. And what the phenomenon is, is that uh, the prices um, is become so high, so um, we really need to evaluate, to find the value of the pharmaceutical in a Norwegian setting. So this has not been a problem or a challenge if the price is not has become so incre incredibly high during the last 10 years. But I think to, to understand this uh, process and, and use of pharmacoeconomics in Norway, we need to look very quickly into the regulatory procedures. And if we look at this picture, uh, for very many years, the market authorization was the bottleneck to have access to new pharmaceutical in, in both Europe and in Norway. Uh, and the, the regulatory procedures, they only look at if a new pharmaceutical is working. Do, does it have an effect? Is it safe? Uh, has it quite a good quality? And if you look at this picture, uh, this uh, Kaplan-Meier curve for, for overall survival uh, for this, this new uh, compound for treatment of lung cancer, you could definitely see that compared to the existing treatment, uh, it has an effect. But from a pharmacoeconomic point of view, we really need to see what is the value of this effect, how big, how large is the effect size, and what are we willing to pay for that effect size. And this, I, I think that this Kaplan-Meier curve is showing that when you look at, uh, at when, when half, half the patients are, are not on treatment anymore, you can see that a lot after that, the censoring of patients is very, very high and very few patients are left. So then even though the, the p-value shows an effect, we don't know how long the effect is, how big is the effect compared to the, to the, to the treatments we are using today. And then when you put costs on this as well, then I would say uh, the difficulties uh, um, is, is very easy to see. So that's why we have used this picture for many years that if you take this bridge with, with a hole in the middle, 
you could think of that on one side, it's the regulatory processes that was the market authorization. And on the other hand, it's the payers. And then we have thought as a kind of a picture that HTA, the health technology assessment, will fill in the gap, fill in the missing um, missing data, missing information that we need uh, to, to make a good decision on whether we should uh, start using or paying for a new uh, drug or not. Because the market authorization do not give that answer. It only gives answer that it has better than effect than, um, for, uh, than no treatment and that it's safe or the benefit risk is positive and it's made with good quality. So the new bottleneck now is not the market authorization anymore, it's the price and reimbursement evaluation. So to, to give a quick overlook over Norway, we are a quite small country in the northern part of Europe, about five million inhabitants. We have a uh, universal public health system and the health care services are financed primarily through taxes. So there is very, very seldom or little co-payment from the inhabitants to receive uh, health care. Uh, and all residents in Norway are members in the national insurance scheme. So that means that uh, all the medications you need uh, they are um, more or less for free. The co-payment is very, very low or none at all. Um, it's only Christina, paid. Would, would no co-payments apply at the primary healthcare level um, and also at the hospital level, uh, tertiary healthcare institutions? <clears throat> at the primary level, there's a very small amount of co-payments for those over 16. Uh, okay. But it, it's in, in in US dollar, it's like two hundred dollars uh, per year. Okay. So it's approximately nothing. Uh, okay. And in yeah. the in the hospitals, there's no copayment. Okay. At all. all right. Okay. So that means, for example, if you need treatment for for your cancer, that has no copayment and it's free for everyone. Okay. So that brings us on to how pharmaceuticals are financed in Norway. And we divide it in two. We divide it in the outpatients that is covered by the national insurance scheme and the hospitals that are paid by the regional health trust. Um, and you can see on the outpatients, we have uh, a general reimbursement that is decided by NOMA and we have the individually reimbursement named patients that's actually case by case. So if a, if a pharmaceutical is not uh, reimbursed by the general system, there's a kind of, um, uh, there's a kind of um, a way that you might also have it financed uh, individually. But the main rule is the general reimbursement. And if it's not reimbursed by that, then you have to finance it by yourself. But mostly all of it is covered by the general. And in, in the hospitals, uh, they pay for both the inpatients when you're in hospital, and they also pay for a lot of uh, pharmaceuticals that is to be taken by the patients in their own home. So it, this is self-administrated pharmaceuticals. And you can see it's more or less all the new compounds and treatments you will find in that, and, and those who are extremely high priced. Yeah. But so, would um, things like, um, uh, sorry, Christine, um, on the, the yeah. previous slide, would, would things like such as very rare conditions uh, rare oncology conditions, rare diseases, Gaucher, Pompeii, would that fit like under the individually reimbursed name patient um, category or would that be under general reimbursement um, category? Um, at the moment they are at the individual level but we are not transferring them to the general reimbursement and, and doing okay. HCA and, and negotiations so they will 
will fulfill the prioritization criteria. Uh, but uh, they are now financed uh, in the national insurance scheme. Okay, okay. But then and, adult uh, medicines, children's medicines, um, um, that's all usually included under the general reimbursement um, scheme. Yeah. So okay. it, you can see the principles here of whether a, a, a treatment is started, follow up, evaluated, and um, and finished it. Uh, if that's within the hospitals, they are the responsibility for the financiation. And if it's uh, started and and evaluated uh, at the um, general practitioners, it's the outpatient or national insurance scheme that that pays for it. Okay. All right. I understand. Mm -hmm. So uh, the reimbursement schemes is a kind of a positive list. So if uh, a pharmaceutical is listed, then you could prescribe it uh, within this national insurance scheme. Uh, and these individuals, the doctor has to prescribe uh, and apply on the patient's behalf. And of course, uh, there's full reimbursement, no co-payment at all for uh, communicable diseases. And that also includes if a person is in transfer in Norway. So uh, so if you, if you just visited Norway and someone uh, finds out or, or that you, you have an HIV, uh, then you will receive uh, treatment for free as long as you are in Norway. Well, um, uh, do pharmacists play an active role in formerly committees uh, that are, um, or do formerly committees exist? Or do pharmacists play a an important role there? Um, and how are formerly committees used, uh, if at all, to uh, determine the different uh, positive lists um, that are for reimbursement? The, we have these kind of, of, of medicinal committees uh, at the hospital level. Uh, they decide uh, more or less uh, which um, brands the, the different, different hospitals would like to use. But all the other is on the national level is, and, and this positive list is decided by the NOMA. Um, okay. So everything is on a national level, but of course okay. the pharmacist has plays an important role uh, when it comes to um, um, adherence uh, of the recommendations and the following up of the recommendations and the positive list and what kind of uh, there there is uh, there's yearly. Uh, different tendering processes from the different uh, therapeutic areas, and the pharmacist playing uh, an, an important role to to help uh, fulfill the the tender. Uh, so the the recommendations are to be followed because okay. it's it's really good. It's really needed to have um, uh, adherence to the uh, and compliance to the. To the recommendations, so we could have better tender and the same tender, or even better next year. So this okay. is an, an important role, and of course the pharmacists are active in, at, at at the hospitals uh, uh, when treatment is decided. What kind of treatment the 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 individual patient is is going to have? Okay. Okay. Uh, so what we have done uh, since the beginning of 2000 to control the healthcare expenditures, because in Norway as well we have seen an incredible rise and increase in in the expenditures. So um, we have um, quite. Uh, um, uh, demanding legislation saying what to do and not. And uh, the first thing that was introduced in, in 2000 was a maximum price for all prescription drugs uh, for, for human beings and it's annually revised. So we have this kind of uh, a system and the legislation says that we should have 
a kind of reference pricing for where we we take the prices from nine different uh, countries in the northern Europe, predefined okay. countries, and we take the average of the three lowest prices, and uh, we adjust it uh, with um, the currency rate, and then that will be the price. So that means that when we do this this annually, the price spiral will will go downwards. Okay. Uh, so so that's one one kind of controlling mechanism. Uh, and and then of course it's the instrument of HTA where you see the value of a new pharmaceutical according to the price and and the Norwegian setting. And um, the the reimbursement is not given before the HTA is performed. And then of course we have a very for, for those uh, drugs that have no longer patented, and they are uh, generic substitutions in the pharmacy. So here, the pharmacist is uh, is substituting um, uh, generics between the generics, uh, and always uh, delivers what the cheapest one. Uh, so it's the pharmacist that the pharmacist to decide uh, which which product to the patient is receiving. Uh, and then, of course, to to have, um, since we are a quite small country with only 5 million inhabitants, then um, generic prices was, was, was very difficult to find a controlling mechanism of both that we had the lowest possible prices for Norway and that we got uh, a price reduction at all. So we, we struggled a bit in the beginning of 2000 how we should find a, a mechanism of, of reducing the prices. So then in 2005 we introduced a kind of system called stepped price model where when when a generic compound is on the market and, and we have competition then the prices is cut uh, by okay. a predefined um, Discount, and then we 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 following it up with predefined um, discounts. So that is well functioning. Of course, it doesn't give the absolute lowest prices, but then we have a variety of products, and we um, actually are uh, quite happy about this system since we are not the biggest country. And then we have tried other controlling mechanisms as preferred medicine. Uh, that kind of therapeutic uh, interchangeability. And then we have tried a few cases of risk sharing agreements or other kinds of managed entry agreements um, to, to have um, bearable and, and uh, acceptable prices. But we, we must say it's difficult to, to have the risk sharing agreements because our experience is that we take all the risk and we are not uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> having so much value of it. So we, we must admit that we are most in favor of flat discounts. Um, I understand. The, the point five that you, you mentioned on that slide, uh, Christine, was quite interesting. The, the stepped um, price model, was that based on the availability of generic alternatives for the the innovative medicine so when the first generic was available then the price would be reduced by x amount and if the second exactly. generic was available it would be no. x plus more is is that the idea it 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 stops actually when when the first generic compounds enter the market uh, it's the pharmacy who has to find someone who can deliver to that price so either okay. that is the uh, either that is the generic or it is the originator. Um, that doesn't matter to us as uh, authorities. We only want to pay the set price. So they have to find uh, a manufacturer that can deliver to that price. Oh, I see. Okay. And has there ever been any uh, difficulties from the uh, pharmacy side to find a, a national supplier? Um, no, uh, at the, that, the price there, I, never. Okay. No, that has not been the problem because there have been many suppliers and the pharmacy chain. We have three pharmacy chain in Norway, and they 
they could then um, always negotiate with different suppliers. And so uh, within the step price system, we have very, very, very seldom shortages. Uh, okay. it, it's uh, more difficult when you have when when you have the national tender for hospitals where all of Norway chose the same supplier there okay. in that situation we have seen um an increase in shortages especially in m more critical compounds like antibiotics penicillins etc uh, so that is more critical than um than in the set price because there you have uh, many suppliers. Okay, okay, understand. And then in point number seven, you mentioned a risk sharing agreement. Some haven't uh, worked as well. Um, uh, has it been in specific uh, therapeutic areas uh, like oncology, multiple sclerosis, or, or others? Um, and and you mentioned um, that, that risk was mostly on the side of the policymaker. Uh, we have had risk sharing agreements in. Um, diabetes uh, from okay. years ago and we have one compound now uh, in the oncology field uh, that is uh, for breast cancer uh, and we have one, one agreement also uh, within the cholesterol lowering um, uh, therapy um, okay. the, the new one PCSK9 inhibitors uh, there okay. we have a repairing uh, uh, agreement, but uh, okay. I I think uh, our uh, our experience until now is that um, there is quite a lot of following up from our side, and that okay. also uh, has a cost. Uh, okay. So uh, flat discounts where you could either have payback or you could have an, an uh, a decrease in in what you pay for uh, is better. Okay, it's um, easier to to manage, right? Instead of doing the yeah. the admin, administrative work uh, for risk sharing agreements. Yeah, and uh, what the well, our experience is that something that seems very easy when you when you make the agreement. When you're doing the following up, uh, things aren't that easy anymore. <laughs> There's always <laughs> some new questions, and uh, oh. uh, yes. so um, <laughs> so to find the the best thing is not to have any point where you could disagree. Okay. Yes. Okay. So so then we now work us into the area of pharmacoeconomics because what what we we ta we started the lesson was that what is the value and what is the difficulties yes it's the prices that are so sky high so then we need to find a kind of a measure that what is the value and how we should va uh, measure value and we do that by by the uh, by using quality quality adjusted life years uh, okay. And then, and then, when you when you use these methods, when we use uh, utility uh, evaluations, and you find this cost per quality, this good cost for a good good life year, then very sudden the question about the threshold, how much are we willing to pay, is a question that is very quickly raised. And another question is that is a quality a quality? Uh, what about the severity of the disease? Are we willing to pay the same um, amount of, of money for for a quality that for a very severe disease, or are we not? Okay. So so these kinds of discussions we have had for many years in Norway. Uh, and we landed on that we need uh, tools and instruments to do these evaluations for uh, so we could have a more systematic introduction of, of new technologies in Norway. And uh, so we yep. could have the rational use of, of health resources. So we could, uh, very important, have a more transparent process and decisions. 
for, for the outpatients, we have used HTA as a tool for decision making uh, since 2000. But in hospitals, there has no, there hasn't been any transparent way of making decisions. There's only been kind of doctor that says, hmm, I would like to start using that or that. So, okay. so it, it was not based upon any uh, evaluation at all. So when when the prices became higher and higher, and and there were need for what is actually the value of this, this started the discussion that we need to do HTA and for more economics for for hospital drugs as well. Okay. So then we try now to have a timeline. Uh, when will a new uh, technology enter the Norwegian market? Uh, how can we implement that in national guidelines? Uh, what will the budget impact be both in a national level or a hospital level? So then we created this uh, evaluation process, process and a very short version of this can, can be into four, four different steps. When we start with horizon scanning, a very simple version of horizon scanning that we we actually look which kind of product has started the evaluation process for market authorization at the European level at, at EMA. That's the same okay. as FDA. And when when they have started their evaluation process at EMA, then we we make a kind of horizon scanning short report. And that is the starting point for the health technology assessment at NOMA. So then we start the dialogue by the, by the manufacturers and we ask them to send in documentation packages for both clinical effect and health economics. And then we perform the health, uh, health technology assessment at NOMA and um, we also um, help the negotiation and tendering organization to do uh, to do these price negotiations. And when we are all finished with that, then we have a clear um, recommendation to the health trust uh, whether the prioritization criteria are fulfilled and uh, what they what we recommend them to decide. And if it's outpatient, we do the decision by ourselves here in Nome. And then there's implementation. So these four steps is, is um, for all new pharmaceuticals that, that will have no uh, financiation in, in Norway. Fantastic. So, um, so here's another picture showing exactly the same. So that means that all new drugs, treatments, indication, and combinations of medicines, we have to do with HTA, and then uh, a decision is made. So now we have been doing this since 2013, and, and the system is actually working quite well. So then I think it's, it's, it's important to see what is, the, when, when the decision is to be made, what is the decision made upon? Yes, it's, it's uh, the value. And the, the government has decided that um, we should have, that there are three criteria for, for priority. And that is the utility for the patient, the resource use, and the severity of the disease. So okay. then we have to assess these three criteria, and if these three criteria are fulfilled, uh, and then we, we have a cost per quality, uh, and we have then a, um, a threshold for how much cost per quality could be uh, when you um, when you look upon the the severity, and we measure actually the severity by uh, absolute uh, shortfall. Okay. So no, n before we used to have this, uh, we, we thought something was severe, but now we actually calculate it by uh, the absolute loss 
uh, of, uh, of of what the patient will if the patient have this disease and not having these treatments, uh, what they actually what they would lose. So the absolute right. shortfall. Um, uh, Christine, are these evaluations the the three criteria that you mentioned: priority setting, utility for the patient, resource use, and severity of the disease? Are are these HTAs that are done internally at NOMA and the, yeah. with um, data that is requested, or is this manufacturers that are developing the HTA then submitting it for your for your review? Um. Uh, the, 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 it's the manufacturers that has to submit it. But if okay. the manufacturers are not willing to submit the documentation that will will document these priority criteria, then we have to make it um, make these documentations by ourselves or this evaluation by ourselves. And then, okay. of course, this is very often not in favor for the company. So they are. Okay. Our experience is that they are quite willing to share this information. Of course, not every time the 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 level of information and the level of documentation is good enough. So the uncertainty is quite high, but uh, they are very willing to deliver um, and submit um, documentation packages. Okay. So we have quite good dialogue with the companies all the way through the evaluation process and, and, and before and during the process. And of course, when they see our, our assessment, uh, then we very often is go, uh, are receiving new offers when they, where they lower their price when they see our assessment and they have been part of the assessment as well so they have they have seen where what how we think and how we think about the prior, priority criteria if they are fulfilled okay. or not okay so, uh, the, uh, the other question i had is that part of the the that first uh, criteria utility for the the patient um, just so that i understand does it mean that um, for example, you've mentioned PCSK9 inhibitors in cardiovascular disease, that um, the utility values that are used to measuring the, the quali gains and the utilities, um, uh, does it have to be measured in Norwegian cardiovascular patient population? Or uh, is that what that point means? Um, or, or are utilities from other countries uh, used in the context of, of Norway? Uh, both. Uh, of course, we would always like to have the studies performed in Norwegian patients with Norwegian's um, uh, way of treatment, treating the patients and, and Norwegian's use of resources. But we are a small country, so that's very seldom. Okay. So, so very often uh, the, the, um, the studies that are used in the market authorization procedure is, is the one that um, document the use of, of resources and the utility and then we ask the company to map it into a Norwegian setting. Uh, oh, and, okay. Yeah, so that is the most uh, usual way we do and, and then when you have this kind of mapping then you uh, you adjust with Norwegian way of, of treatment and Norwegian guidelines uh, and, and of course we if the comparators in the in the studies are not the one in Norway then very often we ask them to do different kind of network meta analysis or multi, or or mic multi adjusted uh, indirect comparisons to see that the what 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 is the effect in when you use the norwegian setting okay all right. Uh, but of course, we we know very very well that we are a small country, and not everyone is like us. So, of course, that is in our mind. Yeah. So, um, so when it, when we come over to the willingness to pay, then of course we have the cost per quality, and we have to compare it with the opportunity cost. What is the cost 
for the treatment uh, that they would have received if the new treatment was not available. And then, of course, we combine it with the effectiveness ratio with the severity of the disease. So the, the higher of the severity, the more willing we are to pay. So, okay. uh, so, but of course, there will be thresholds all the way. Uh, but, but for, for, for example, um, cancers uh, will or could have a higher willingness. Uh, we are, we could be willing to pay more for cancer diseases than than other diseases. For example, the one with the, with the um, high cholesterol, like the PCSK9 inhibitors, when when the patients actually are having quite an efficient treatment of today with with, with the other uh, cholesterol lowering uh, drugs so the added value of of the new um, treatment is is not very very much and uh, and when you look upon the severity of the disease it's not become worsening for the patient group so our willingness to pay for them is is not at the highest level but of course, for 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 um, for cancer patients, and of course, uh, patients uh, with, for example, chronic ill diseases like MS or, or children, yeah. they will have a higher severity uh, okay. than okay. others. So so it's it's quite uh, difficult, but uh, I think it's fair, and uh, this has been discussed. Uh, within the government, and uh, they have adopted it. So, so I, I think this is um, the way we should perform it in the future as well. Okay. So, so just, just I just calculated in what what is the opportunity cost in Norway, and that's approximately thirty two two thousand dollars per per quality. So, and then it's the the um, the threshold for the most severe diseases you could you could um, take that by uh, three so it's thirty two thousand dollars times three that will give you an um, look into how how much we are willing to pay for the most severe diseases okay. Uh, so, what we now see is that if we, we look into into those therapeutic areas where we have a lot of therapeutic equal compounds, we see that by using HTA as a tool, we then we then first set the ceiling that says that now is the prioritization criteria fulfilled. That shows is shown by the red line here is the, our willingness to pay. And then when we when we put them into competition and in a tender, then we see very often that they um, uh, they put them put the price lower uh, quite much lower than our willingness to pay the ceiling is uh, the ceiling for uh, for willing to pay is uh, very often higher than the actual price the different manufacturers are, are offering us so and so when you have these kind of competitions then you you are able to have quite big savings in in uh, the different therapeutic areas, so so we we are we are quite satisfied by by doing this um, in Norway. So the latest now is is um, treatment of um, hepatitis C, where the new drugs uh, when they entered the market four years ago, the price was extremely high. Uh, so we had to limit the use very much. And now when we have a lot of compounds on the market and we have put them in a competition uh, and say that they are more or less equal, then the price 
has gone down by 60% or something, 60-70%. And that's only in a few years that the price has dropped so dramatically. So now everyone is having the opportunity to have these new treatments for hepatitis C. Yeah, so this is great. just an example of when you combine both HGA and the market competition, then you, you could really have big results even in a small country like, like Norway. So uh, what I have some kind of further reading in English, uh, and that is a, a description of the national system for, for introducing new technologies in Norway. And of, of course, uh, the principles for priority setting in the healthcare. Uh, that's a white paper uh, from 2016 and was adopted by the government uh, later in December 2016. And now uh, the legislation is built upon. So this uh, is... Chris uh, Christine, this is fantastic, and, and thank you very much for, for the pre presentation. Um, I appreciate it. There, there's a question that, that came to mind. Is that you mentioned the three criteria for, for priority setting. I, I was just wondering, to what extent does age um, feature as one of those priority <laughs> settings? Would, would younger children be given preference compared to the elderly, uh, for example? Actually, uh, as you see, the, the age is not specific mentioned in the criteria uh, in the priority, uh, priority setting, but indirectly, when you calculate um, the severity, then if a child, then the child will lose so many years. If you say that the maximum age uh, in quality adjusted life years is like 70, that you could, a person could have 70 uh, uh, qualities in their life. Uh, so uh, if you uh, then lose, uh, if you're a child, then you might lose as much as, for example, 65 to 67. They have a higher priority than, for example, uh, a man with prostate cancer. Um, that man will probably lose like six qualities or something. So our willingness to pay will indirectly um, take age into consideration. Okay, okay, fantastic. And um, uh, Adam, I'm curious, um, of all the HTA submissions that are made to NOMA, um, of a, just a, a rough proportion, how, how many of them come below the $32,000 uh, per quality adjusted life year or 270000 Norwegian krona? Uh, and and you, must, uh, you must take it times three, so you could uh, okay. put in, in, the, in the severity as well. And and I would say um, if we if you take the 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 the, um, the threshold uh, on top and according to the severity, I would say as much as as 80% of all HCAs we perform is within that. So approximately 20% receives a no. Um, okay. So so we we are quite good at. Um, negotiating so we could have access to our patients. Okay, okay, that's uh, that's fantastic. So, um, uh, Christine, uh, thanks uh, again for your, your presentation. I um, uh, really appreciate it. Um, I think this is a very useful resource. And, and the, these two further reading items that you, you mentioned uh, at the uh, on your last slide. Um, I think these are two good resources uh, as a follow-up uh, conversation piece. Um, mm -hmm. And if uh, there's any questions uh, from from listeners, um, um, you know, I'd be happy to. I think uh, on one of your last slides, you you had a Facebook account or Twitter account or, yeah, or please. the Noma. Yeah. So the um, you know listeners can definitely uh, send a messages to to Norma. Um, mm -hmm. on the social media accounts uh, if you have any follow-up questions or, or directly to uh, Christine. Yeah, please, please send me an email as well. And if there's the need, uh, I, I'd be happy to answer questions, both uh, both in a more oral setting or, or, or um, on email or all these uh, social media. 
Yeah, that's fantastic, uh, uh, Christine. 